for Victoria. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will be sharing my time with the Honourable Member for Churchill. I rise today to deliver my first speech as Member of Parliament for Victoria. Yeah. I'm anxious to contribute to this historic debate on the plight of Aboriginal peoples, but please, before doing so, permit me to begin by thanking sincerely the people of Victoria for giving me the opportunity to serve in this role. As everyone in this place knows, there's no greater honour or privilege than to serve our fellow citizens. Being part of the, the Canadian democratic process up close and personal recently as a candidate was without doubt one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. I did so with the support not only of, uh, of my family, but with the help of virtually hundreds of volunteers, dedicated and selfless people, and I want to pay tribute to them for their tireless work because I will never forget that without them, I would not be here today. I must also, Mr. Speaker, acknowledge the constant support of the former mem Member of Parliament for Victoria, Denise Savoie, who I know was so well respected on both sides of this House. Not only was she a very successful Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, but her behaviour in this place was a true example of the kind of civility and respect that I desired to follow. On the basis of conversations with countless members, I can, uh, I, I can say for sure that she will be greatly missed in this place. I wish to place my remarks today in context and tell you a little bit about why I'm so honoured personally to be able to speak about the continuing quest of Aboriginal people for justice. I've had the opportunity to work for governments, industry and First Nations in consultation efforts before becoming an MP. I was a treaty negotiator for over a decade on Vancouver Island representing the province of British Columbia and I visited virtually every First Nation community on Vancouver Island. I also worked with First Nations in Nunavut, with the, with the Inuit, as well as First Nations in northeastern British Columbia in negotiating economic development agreements. So I think this work has given me some familiarity with the sense of desperation that marks the lives of so many of our fellow citizens. Not only those who live on remote reserves, but also those who live in poverty in our major cities. There's probably little value in repeating the litany of shocking statistics that we all know so well. The suicide rates, the dropout rates, the infant mortality rates, and the deplorable conditions of those living in communities like Attawapiskat or closer to my home in Victoria, the Pachidat First Nation. In trying to come up with solutions, Mr. Speaker, I also believe there's little utility in bringing up the failures and disappointments from the past. It doesn't help to bemoan the fact that the Kelowna Accord was never implemented or that so little seems to have been done with the sweeping and excellent recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Instead, Mr. Speaker, Canadians of good faith must work together urgently to seek fresh solutions. Solutions that are grounded in the work of the past and the blueprint of the Dussault Erasmus report, but only as a point of departure. Because, Mr. Speaker, the time for action is certainly long overdue. What is desperately required are fresh ideas that are grounded with a recognition of constitutional rights of First Nations to meaningful consultation and recognition of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the Crown and First Nation peoples. And when I say the word respect, Mr. Speaker, when I say the word respect, all the First Nations with whom I've had the privilege to work constantly remind us of the need for respect. For example, the language of the Nechalnith people uses the word isa to connote that concept of respect. First Nations have demanded that we establish a new relationship grounded on this bedrock principle of respect. Now, there are two things that I would like to speak to today in this context, which I think are central to meaningful, ongoing economic development that will work for the Inuit, the Métis, and First Nations people in Canada. They are consultation and the recognition of self-government. Mr. Speaker, this government simply must do a better job on consultation. We all know there's this constitutional duty to consult and where appropriate accommodate. Aboriginal and treaty rights, but 
It's not through endless lawsuits that the concept of consultation will be determined. And it's not through these rote exercises of counting how many meetings you attended or seeing who was there and tallying it up and seeing if a court will later say that it was satisfactory. That's not what it's about, Mr. Speaker. It's about respect, it's about communication, and it's about establishing long-term relationships. These are the three things that are going to ultimately make the difference. Going through the motions, lots of words, Courts are not going to accept that. They haven't in the past. They're going to insist on meaningful consultation. And, as they've reminded us recently, that this is grounded in the honour of the Crown. That's always going to be the touchstone of our relationship with the First Nations going forward. As the recent Idle No More movement and Aboriginal uh, leadership has so passionately argued, the current government has weakened the environmental protection laws on which First Nations communities depend. And the regrettable omnibus budget bills have failed to take into account treaty rights, which was a the basis of the historic relationship between the Crown and First Nations people. In some parts of the country, notably British Columbia and the North, there were no historic treaties. And so it's Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, which is the basis of the Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title that are enshrined. Aboriginal communities simply have a right to participate in the management and disposition of lands and resources over which they have asserted claims, even if those claims haven't yet been recognized by the courts or finally resolved. In more modern terms, in British Columbia, the duty to consult and accommodate has simply not been observed by this government. For example, the application by Enbridge to build its bitumen pipeline from the oil sands to Prince Rupert has attracted vociferous opposition from First Nations across the province. They are joined by the majority of non-Aboriginal British Columbians in saying we agree and oppose this deeply flawed proposal. The vast majority of First Nations of communities have said no to this kind of dangerous pipeline and tanker project as have the people of British Columbia by majority. It's simply not acceptable, the risks that we are being asked to, uh, uh, to uh, accept. And I can tell you, as a recent candidate in a coastal community like Victoria, there is enormous opposition to this project that people, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, agree with. And I think it's time for this government as well to say no to the kind of short-sighted kind of development that Enbridge represents. We simply have to do a better job of consultation. Of turning to self-government, what does that mean? It means, I think, in the words of uh, Stephen Cornell of the Harvard Project on American, Ind Ind American Indian Economic Development, three things in their research. That jurisdiction counts, self-government matters, effective governing institutions are essential, and that these governing institutions must be appropriate to the cultures in which they are situated. In short, good government matters. And that is why I would like to salute the excellent work being done by Miles Richardson, former president of the Haida Nation, who is now working as a senior associate with the Institute on Governance. His objective, their objective, is to improve governance arrangements for First Nations so they can be more effective partners in economic development. In addition, the government institutions have to be culturally appropriate and have the support of the people. He says this, Professor Cornell states, quote, institutions that match contemporary indigenous cultures are more successful than those that don't. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I know the Conservatives will say simply that the budget 2013 is all about job creation and economic development and First Nations will benefit as other Canadians do. That is the mantra. But without, Mr. Speaker, the real application of the constitutional requirements of meaningful consultation and a recognition of self-government, government-to-government relationships, this economic development will not occur and will not be meaningful on the ground of First Nations. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Here, here.